25% of women in technology, 25% in management positions, leadership positions, 15% in C-suite and boardrooms. We're making progress, but it is agonizingly slow. And one of the things I've been writing about a lot lately is we will not be able to bend the curve alone as women. Progress requires not the half, but the whole. And so when I saw a video of our next speaker, I knew he needed to come and talk to us because he's as passionate as I am about men being part of this journey. Jeffrey Halter is the president of Why Women, a strategic consulting company that's focused on engaging men in women's leadership advancement, and he was formerly director of diversity strategy for Coca-Cola. So please give a warm welcome to Jeffrey Halter. Shoes, women's shoes. What could women's shoes possibly have to do with engaging men in women's leadership advancement? Well, believe it or not, first they represent discomfort, certainly for me at this moment. More importantly, they represent the discomfort that men have in even wanting to have a conversation around gender differences in the workplace. Second, they represent the different experiences men and women are having. Long before Dancing with the Stars, there was Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, and Ginger was asked about Dancing with Fred. She said, Fred's an amazing dancer, but a woman is expected to do everything a man does, flawlessly dancing backwards wearing high heels. And I think this does a great job of articulating the fact that genders are having different experiences in the workplace. And then if we look at shoes as a representation of leadership, 17 out of 20 pairs still belong to men. 85% of senior leadership. Only three pairs belong to women. And if we move up to the C-suite, that drops to one pair. And so what I'll tell you is, if men are 85% of senior leadership, well, I think we're 85% of the problem, but we're also 85% of the solution. And so my goal today is to spend a few minutes with you and get you to go back and talk to your organization about the ready now men, those 30 to 40% of men that you can invite into this conversation who want to help you. And I know one of the themes is let's put smart to work. I'd like to say let's put smart women to work and smart men to work. But I'm actually going to ask you to do one less thing. I think it's time we stop asking women to lean in and we ask men to stand up. This is not a women's issue. We've heard this. This is an organizational issue. And so what I'm going to do is spend just a few minutes engaging with you on how to have a comfortable conversation around bringing men in to this conversation. And so I'm going to get comfortable and talk about the why. When you go back and talk to men, you have to talk in business terms. The why, grow revenue by understanding our customers and consumers better. Improve operating profit through better talent management, better engagement, better innovation. Enhance your company reputation. Your reputation is under attack in social media, from activist shareholders, whether you know it or not. And it's what great companies do. I would have been so disappointed this morning if Ginny had gotten up and said, I want to make IBM the most mediocre company in America. This is a baseline expectation of what great companies do today. Let me tell you what it's not. It's not a journey. And you used journey right when I came up here. People go on journeys. But I hear a lot of D&I practitioners, diversity and inclusion practitioners, say our company's on a diversity journey. I was in sales for 20 years. I never went on a sales journey. If I didn't make my goal every quarter, they fired me. We cannot let this soft speak permeate this really important topic. It's not a nice thing to do. It's not a women's thing. And it's not a men lose, women win. According to NAFI, National Association of Female Executives, in this country, in best in class companies, two out of three promotions are still going to men. And in most companies, seven out of eight promotions are going to men. There is no factual proof that men are being disparately impacted by advancing women. 
Now, I've been a little hard on the men, so I want to acknowledge the men in the room. The five, ten men, raise your hands. Give them a hand. <laughs> Ladies, when you take over, and I know you will, remember we were here for you, this 50 of us. <laughs> that being said, this is the last time we should applaud men for showing up at a women's leadership event. It should be an expectation of every leader in the organization. Yes. And I don't mean to pick on men, but as a business person, this is where the opportunity is. Mercer did a report, three million employees globally, and they said, which employees are the least engaged in diversity and inclusion initiatives? And the results, 39% of middle managers and 38% of men. Again, not to single them out, that's four in 10. I think that might be a good number. But as a business person, this represents the biggest gap that I have to close. You don't have to convince women and people of color and other underrepresented minorities that diversity is a good thing. You've got to convince these two groups, and oh, by the way, they're the largest stakeholders in our company. So middle managers and men are critical to driving this change. And oh, by the way, best in class looks like 48%. That's a 25% 25 25 increase if we do this well. So what do we do? We engage and leverage women. Companies with more women on board, you know these numbers, 53% higher return on equity, 42% higher return on sales, 66% return on invested capital. Anytime we add women to the mix, we get incremental business results. Yet, we just don't want to talk about adding women at the board. But adding women to the board creates an organization where women are allowed to thrive and to prosper and drive exponential business results. So what do men need to do? Four simple things. Number one, listen. So many men want to start by leading, and they have no context. I coach men, I coach senior leaders. Take a woman to coffee and ask a simple question. Tell me what it's like to be a woman working here. And oh, by the way, you're not gonna tell me anything. You don't wanna be the flag bearer for all things women in the organization. And I coach them to ask again, what else don't I know? And you'll go a little deeper and then I say, ask one more time. And in that last 10 minutes, I'm going to hear root cause issues of bias that I did not know existed. And then I can start to change things. Then learn. Deepen your knowledge. How do you talk about the business case within your organization? From a revenue standpoint, our customers are changing. Women are sitting on 40% of purchasing desks. I do a lot of work with Department of Defense. There's all kinds of women there. We've got a lot of B2B customers here. Well, women are holding more and more IT roles. And there's a great Harvard Business Review study that says you can't show up with a bunch of 42 longs and expect to be successful today. So it's about our customers changing. And then lead. Now's the time to lead. And leadership looks like asking tough questions, specifically three questions. Leaders need to ask, tell me how many men you lost last year and how many women you lost. I guarantee you have always lost more women. And as a leader, you can't take the answer when you're told, well, she left to spend more time with her family. Because 60% of women leave your company and go to work for a competitor or someone else in your industry or hang out their own shingle. They're leaving because of the company or the manager. Question two, what's your plan to engage more women next year? What's your plan? Simple as that. And then number three, how are you going to drive that down to middle managers and men? So that's it. That's the 80% head stuff. You're in a data business. It's about facts. It's about data. This is how we engage men. But advocacy lives in the 20% stuff. It lives in the heart stuff. 
And this is where will comes in. Advancing women today is actually a lot like diet and exercise. Everybody knows it's a really good idea, and yet we don't exercise and we still reach for the Krispy Kreme. <laughs> what I have found is will comes from personal accountability, this personal connection, and Patty touched on it. I'm gonna take it a little deeper. It's men and women realizing that if we're not advocating for women today, we are betraying our daughters' futures. And I say this because I came to this very late in life. I'm a boomer, and uh, I wanted to raise a strong daughter. I really did. I encouraged her, whether it was soccer or art, music. I made sure my daughter went to a great college. And when my daughter graduates and makes 83 cents to my son, when my daughter is faced with the biases that I know exist in my company, when, I, when my daughter has to face Ron down the hall, who I know is a sexist, biased uh, individual, I choose to do nothing. I choose not to advocate for one of the most important people in our lives. The way we're going to drive long-term systemic change for women is to get a bunch of angry fathers to realize the responsibility that they have. Yes, thank you. So what does it look like? It looks like pledging your commitment. Please go to my website. There's no fee for this. Download, advocate, download the Advocating for Women initiative. You print out a form and you sign this. You commit to do one of 10 things, and here's the list of what that looks like. Put your daughter's name on it or a woman in your life's name on it, sign it, and put it up on your desk. It marks you as an advocate. And this visible, symbolic commitment is critical to driving change. And that's how we're going to drive change in this organization and in this company. And it's how we're going to make more money. And it's how we're going to be an employer of choice. So with that, I want you to leave thinking about shoes. Not size 14 red pumps, but all the shoes that our daughters are going to wear and the women in our lives are going to wear. And then go back and talk to the men and the women in their lives, in your lives, about the responsibility that they have. Thank you for your time. You can get a copy of this presentation. Reach out to me. I would love to hear from you. I didn't get a glass of wine brought to me. I didn't come up with one. So you can find me at the bar at the end of this. So uh, thank you very much. That was awesome. Thank you so much. And I love the practical advice. This is a journey all of us can take together, which is what makes it so enriching and rewarding for my daughter and also for my son.